novel molecular solution for UV light detection in C. elegans. I was asked if this is an easier paper to read with this short pre-lecture. So a bunch of stuff about C. neurobiotis and then tiny little bit about what we already know about the molecular basis of sensation in two different cases, the senses of taste and smell. I could go into vision and other things, but that's beyond the paper. Okay. So here's C. neurobiotis. We're talking about C. neurobiotis visual sensation. Note, there are no eyes in nematodes. So it's interesting to be reading a paper about their ability to sense light. Do they have photoreceptors? Good question. We're going to find out. Something that you do. Do they have photoreceptors? Do they respond to light at all? So I'm going to show you a movie in a minute that will hopefully address your, your question. Okay. A little bit about nomenclature. Sorry. It's an easy paper to read, but I think. But there's some nomenclature. So just so you've had the background, you will not remember this. That's fine. But just so I've told you, I feel better about myself. Every gene is italics and lowercase usually a three to four letter thing like light one here. So that's a gene name, lowercase, italics, some letters, and then a serial number. So in case somebody later finds that there's a light two gene, they can call it light two. The proteins have the exact same letters and numbers as the gene name, but they're uppercase and not italics. I don't know. And this, of course, the nomenclature for this species for C. elegans is different for Drosophila nomenclature, which is different from yeast nomenclature. So if you really want to be an outstanding molecular biologist and geneticist, you have to memorize all of these different systems and their little idiosyncrasies about how their genes are. <laughs> the nomenclature, so every, every organism has a sort of internally appointed or self-appointed nomenclature committee. And so it's historical. At some point, everybody that founded these model organisms in terms of their research came up with this. And they did it separately decades ago. And now it's just, anyway, that's a little bit of history about nomenclature. The thing that's most useful to remember about Cenorhabditis is how the genes are named. A lot of the genes are named after what happens to the worm when you get rid of the gene which is incredibly confusing and totally bass backwards. So there's a set of genes called DPY, dumpy genes. When you don't have a dumpy gene, that causes the word worm to be that phenotype, dumpy or short, short and kind of squat doesn't look like a normal worm. So what you wind up having to remember, maybe, for next week, is that that means that the gene that's mutated normally is doing the opposite of what its phenotype is. That is, a dumpy gene, it's called dumpy because when you don't have the gene, you're dumpy. So when you do have the gene, that means you're normal, which means the gene is promoting you being normal and long instead of short and chubby. I don't know. I work in this field. I get it. But, you know, was it the right thing to do? I don't know. I like it better than Drosophila, though. Anybody in here working with Drosophila? OK, good. Pardon? About to. About to? With? Yeah. Oh, excellent. Yeah, Drosophila, their genes are named after phenotypes, too. Torpedo, gherkin. I mean, they're, they're bizarre, but some of them have nothing to do with the phenotype. Or at least it's hard to, sonic hedgehog, Indian hedgehog, desert hedgehog. At least in Cenorhabditis, the phenotypes are kind of descriptive. Drosophila, I'm not sure anymore. I think people are just making Okay. Now, here it's getting a little bit more into what's critical for next week. Next week, you're going to read something about unk worms. So like genes and like proteins, 
then there are phenotypes, that is, what is the, a description of what the worm actually looks like when it's mutant. That's first letter, uppercase, the rest not, not italicized, sorry. What unk means is the worm is uncoordinated, which to you means it's paralyzed. So if the, there are unk genes, if you get rid of the unk gene, if it's a mutation, then the worm becomes unk, uncoordinated. What that means is these genes normally involved in what process? If you get rid of the gene and the worm is no longer able to move, what sort of system of the worm do you think these genes are part of? They're probably neuronal genes or they're muscular genes, musculature genes. It turns out most of them are neuronal pathways. Something about neuron signaling, right? You get rid of that gene, then your neurons can't do anything, then you're paralyzed, you're unk, uncoordinated. Okay. One of the approaches that they're going to use is a for forward genetic screen. This is what it's for. When you're trying to find genes that produce a particular phenotype. So this is all you do. You take a bunch of normal wild type worms, you throw a chemical on them that causes DNA mutations. Poor worms. What you're trying to do is break the function of a gene, make a null mutation. Make a dumpy, make an unk worm. Right? So you're throwing mutagen on a bunch of worms, then you look at all the worms, and you find out which ones have an interesting phenotype, which ones look different than normal, which ones look dumpy. If you find a short, squat worm, after you've thrown chemical on them, what have you done? You've probably mutated a dumpy gene. You've made the word dump, worm dumpy. If you find that one of the worms can't move, you've mutated an unk gene in that worm. So you pick that worm, you isolate it, you know that it's got a mutation in a gene you're interested in. Then you have it make babies so that you keep that mutation around and you study the mutation. So that's exactly what these authors will be doing next week. They don't describe it in, at all, really. They say, we did a forward screen. I think that's all they say. I just wanted you to know that's what they, this is what they meant when, when they said that. You a forward screen to find mutants. It's like a couple weeks of solid work in the lab. Okay. Okay. Now we get to the multi -mutant. It's, yeah, exactly. You were waiting for it. Now, talking about sensory systems worms detecting something happening in their environment. So one of the things the authors have to do is to measure whether or not worms are being active or not. In this case, specifically, whether or not they're unk, uncoordinated, paralyzed, and whether they're responding to stimuli. It's most basic. You want to know, is the worm dead or not? It's kind of hard to tell. Uh, you s the good thing is that Cinerabditis basically don't stop moving. So if they're not moving, they're probably dead or dying. And this is what a wild-type worm looks like when it's moving around a Petri dish. They grow on Petri dishes, and it crawls in a sinusoidal motion. So you can measure basically how fast a worm is moving or how much it's moving by how many body bends per minute, how many of these it does. The number, bigger number means it's going faster or not stopping as much, something like that. The other thing that we do, which we love to do, come up to my lab, I'll show you, because I work with C. Briggsy, not C. Elegans, but it looks identical, is to poke them with a platinum wire. If you think it's dead, you just poke it, and if it moves, if it responds, then it's still alive, and if it doesn't move, then it's dead, right? Right. And you'll see an example of that in just a second. Okay, so a little tiny bit about the molecular basis of sensation. And again, just going through, it's not really nine, is it? No, it's 
Yeah, good. I thought I was okay. So here's a particular type of protein that's involved both in taste and smell. This could be an olfactory receptor. Olfactory receptor. Or it could be a gustatory receptor. Right? A smell receptor or a taste receptor. Olfaction and gustation. And the way both of these types of proteins work is that they are seven transmembrane domain, seven TMD proteins. They sit in the cell membrane like this, with their alpha helices going through the membrane. And almost to an individual gene, there are over a thousand olfactory receptors in us, in humans. We have a thousand different genes that do this. Plus, I don't know how many gustatory receptors we have. They all have the extracellular amino terminus and an intracellular C terminus. So they start on the outside, they go through, 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 and the seventh one means their tail's pointing into the cell. And a little molecule binds to the receptor, and that causes a signaling cascade inside the cell, and the cell responds to whatever odor or taste is bound by the protein. So olfactory receptors... Taste receptors, T1Rs or T2Rs, and also V1Rs and V2Rs, which are hormone or hormone, pheromone receptors. So we do have genes that, rec that receive pheromone signals. Maybe that's what happens when they do those smetty, smelly t-shirt studies. Anyway, I don't know. All of them have N-terminus outside, C-terminus inside vertebrates. You go to insects, like C. elegans, the N-terminus is now in cell and C-terminus is outside, but still a seven transmembrane domain protein. It's just inverted orientation, which is kind of weird, but that's the way it is. So the point, taste and smell are both heavily occupied in terms of sensation by this type of protein. One that sits in the membrane, has seven transmembrane domains, binds to some sort of signal on the outside, and passes the signal into the cell. And this is what is happening, is when that olfactory, when that odor binds, it triggers an internal process that increases cyclic AMP concentration. So the sense of smell sense of taste is entirely based on something binding that protein on your tongue, and then that causes the cell that's got that, that taste receptor to increase the amount of cyclic AMP. And that signals more downstream events that tell your, tells your tongue or your nose what you're tasting or smelling. So next week, cyclic AMP. That's why they're talking about cyclic AMP levels. Vision, not taste, not smell. What's over there on the left side? Rhodopsin, one of our proteins that absorbs light and passes a signal into the cell. Guess what? It's a seven transmembrane domain membrane protein. Just like, similar to, not like, but similar to our taste receptors and our smell receptors. Starting to get a picture of how we sense things. Three different senses, at least. And it passes a signal into the cell, which is doing something with GDP and GTP, not cyclic AMP. But notice that eventually that pathway impinges on cyclic GMP, not cyclic AMP. Right? So there's a lot in common with how we perceive different, our environment in different ways. I don't even know why I put this slide in. You guys know this, right? That's why I have to use sunscreen. Short wavelength light is the ultraviolet light is something that generally speaking organisms, depending on their pigmentation, avoid. Yes, exactly. 
melanoma over here. What is true about Cenorhabditis? Where do they live? Everybody says Cenorhabditis lives in the soil. That's not true. This paper says Cenorhabditis are soil-dwelling dwell nematodes. It's not true. They dwell on rotting fruits and vegetables. They're associated with humans. They're anthropogenic. That is, or sorry, not anthropogenic. They're cosmopolitan. They're associated with human activity. So if you find some place in the world where there are humans, if those humans have compost heaps, you can usually find some Cenorhabditis. And that's partly because Cenorhabditis are bacteriovores. They eat bacteria. Oh. So rotting fruit and vegetables is a great place to find bacterial colonies, so that's often where you find Cenorhabditis. So they're not living deep in the soil. They're living on the surface. So these authors maybe are going to convince you that maybe it's important, potentially important, for Cenorhabditis to be able to sense whether or not they're being cooked in the sun or not, because they don't have eyes. So if you're a little worm and you don't have eyes, how do you know if you're sitting out in the middle of the Sahara Desert versus underneath a nice rotting zucchini, where ultraviolet light is not destroying your DNA? 